And now, without further ado, let me share with you parts of a one of many conversations about teaching, about interpretation, which Henrik Schering and I had, and this not too terribly long ago, simply sitting together in my study talking about music. Henrik, I'm sitting here listening to you, and I can't help but observe that your entire approach to music, couched as it is in the overall total uh, approach, that is not only as a violinist, but as a humanist, entitles you and enables you, perhaps more than most artists today, to pass on that kind of an atmosphere, that kind of a climate, to young students. You yourself are the recipient of some of the finest inspirational powers. You mentioned Flesch. You mentioned Willi Hess. You mentioned Thibault. You mentioned Nadia Boulanger. You yourself have always manifested a great love for teaching. And you have never really given up teaching, even though, as Arthur Rubinstein has warned you, and as we all know, it's, it's a difficult uh, uh, thing to do to maintain the kind of active playing career that you do and still teach. But you do teach. How do you find... How, what is your position, your philosophy, vis-à-vis the old school which still prevails in some of our modern schools today, including Juliet, let's help, let, let's call the baby by its name, that after all, if you want to become a violinist, you practice the violin. As far as the climate is concerned, which gave birth, which begot certain compositions, that's of secondary importance. Your own experience in this way, your own experience and interest in humanities, in uh, languages, in, uh, in uh, political science, all of this, after all, plays a role in the way and the reasons why a composer composes. How do you convey this? To a modern youngster who says, look, uh, Maestro Schering, I'm coming to you to learn to play the violin, and don't bother me with all the rest. Well, I think that your remark <laughs> this is very realistic. He may not say exactly, don't uh, trouble me with the I didn't mean rest. quite no. that literally. But, but, no, no. The point is very well taken, because, indeed, the young student would like very much to penetrate the secrets of technique. But then, first of all, the technical problems must be dealt with. Of course. But then I take for granted that it should be so. And we devote the necessary amount of time to technique. But then, I would never accept in any student the separation of technique and music making. There must be both intertwined. There must be interrelated. One is conducive to the other. And this is where, among the great man I've known in my life and I've worked with and I've been inspired by. I should like to define uh, a few aspects of my personal philosophy. Please do. But in a very simple way. And not necessarily in, in, in the right order. Music 
is, as we know since our childhood, is a many splendid thing. It is also an incredible imposition on your life and on your time and, and of course, on your body. A demanding mistress. It's a most demanding mistress. But it's a mistress which may be jealous and demanding, as you just said. But it's a mistress that never betrays you. Mm -hmm. However, speaking instrumentally now, and I would like to quote Anton Rubinstein's words. He said, if I don't practice for one day, My ears tell me after a concert that um, a few notes are not entirely as beautiful as I would want them. If I don't practice for two days, my critics are already aware of that fact. If I don't practice for three days, the whole audience is aware that I'm not up to my standards. Back to technique. It is a must, and we cannot afford even to think of all the noble initiatives and stylistic deeds necessary to recreate the style, the era, the uh, mannerisms of a composer if we are not in command of our technical means. And I mean both hands. But then, fortunately, nowadays, I think that we have made lots of progress. Nowadays, when I'm conducting my master classes in Mexico, which is every year, or in Geneva, which is every second summer, or sometimes in Ann Arbor, Michigan University. Um, I don't feel that I have to teach my young men or ladies how to play the violin. They already come prepared. Well, that's as it should be. They it? come recommended by very wonderful colleagues of mine. They technical background is there. Furthermore, I think that we still have made lots of progress, and I'm not trying to, to, um, I'm not trying to degrade the great achievements of professors of other times, but I think that to, uh, nowadays, the young man who probably asks me more often than not, how I go about studying a concerto by Paganini. And that's his right. That's, and I am very happy to comply with uh, his requests. But he knows when Paganini was born, what was what uh, the um, the way of playing or the way of singing. I'm referring, of course, to Donizetti. Bellini, etc. Yes. He is uh, very aware of the ep uh, of the very epoch in which Paganini lived. So this makes my my task much easier. However, I sometimes maybe not doing for my students what they exactly expect from me, because there is one thing that I I refuse to do. I would never change her, his or her personality. I would always advocate for a very deep musical insight. And I feel that the interpreter should be, and actually is, the ideal, the ideal friend and the ideal collaborator of the composer. Yes, indeed. I feel that the interpreter is the true 
medium. It's the bridge between the composer and uh, present and future audiences. So, the responsibility is great. Sometimes, and now, I'm coming back to what you said. Don't bother me uh, with uh, historic details. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is some truth in what you insinuated, but it's it's more or less like this. The student would say, Ma Master Shannon, don't you think that I should play this passage of the Beethoven concerto with more virtuosity? And I said, well, suit yourself. But if you ask my opinion, I would say no. Mm. Yes, but you, you know, for the final applause, Dear fellow, would you like to satisfy your ego by a longer or by stronger applause, or would you like to serve the cause of music? Well, it's it's the eternal dilemma to be or not to be. I'm not quite sure that one can serve too many kings, <laughs> and why not? give God what is God's, and to Caesar what is Caesar's. And I mean that it's not necessarily ignoring the, the wish of the public to participate actively in your interpretation that should, um, should uh, um, make for a too great a restraint on your part. No, I think that you should give your feelings and your thoughts and you should show your knowledge of the composer's style and moreover my students have sometimes a great time with me because I I'm either presenting them with or I'm loaning to them books about the life of different composers and I make it rather exciting for them because I said look you shouldn't only know about the beautiful feats and achievements of a composer why don't you try to know much more about his private life his wife his wives his mistresses his friends and also about his enemies some of my students were absolutely stunned when I presented them with photostats of um, reviews on the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto, which, according to a very famous critic in Vienna, mm -hmm. uh, didn't uh, produce a nice perfume. Truly didn't. <laughs> or when uh, also Mr. Hanslick... Uh, didn't entirely approve of Brahms' masterworks. And then I'm trying to convey to my students the very simple idea. The great judge, by and large, is the audience. And if you are true to yourself, you are true to your instrument, true to your composer and his style, you must be a winner. And in most cases, I'm happy to say that this eventuates. But um, where I probably am not entirely in keeping with ideas of some of my colleagues in certain countries, including the United States, is when a student asks me, well, Maestro, could you help me to have a bigger tone? And the young man has a beautiful sound and a very ample sound. He said, you know, I would like my violin to sound almost like a trumpet. So I know that if I play in a, in a 5,000 uh, um, seat hall, I shall be heard everywhere. I'm sorry. I don't comply with this request. I see that in that case, he should have a built-in uh, microphone or... Uh, 
he should just play an electric guitar. We'll continue sharing this conversation which I had with the late Henrik Schering not too long ago in a little while in this program entitled today Henrik Schering in Memoriam. As you may have read in obituaries or in biographies, Henrik Schering became a citizen of Mexico and traveled on a diplomatic passport as cultural ambassador of that great country. He also advanced the cause of composers of the area. And I would like to have us listen to a brief sonata, known as Sonata Breve, by Manuel Ponce, who died in 1948, Mexican composer. Henrik Schering is assisted at the piano by Claude Mayo. Henrik Schering's lifelong concern with the new as well as the established. This was the Sonata Breve by Manuel Ponce of Mexico with Henrik Schering and Claude Mayo. Let's return now to our conversation regarding so many aspects of imparting the art of playing in a humanistic way for which Henrik Schering was so well known. We must also uh, interject here, if you don't mind the, the reference. You have just played a magnificent recital in Carnegie Hall. The reviews were unanimous in saying, in effect, that these were seamless performances intonation was absolutely faithful and yet the interpretation was such that nothing was left to be desired you mentioned yourself Henrik that it is after all the audience which is the judge and I've always felt that the audience has an uncanny sixth sense now if you were to to poll the audience one by one, you may find that not many of them are really knowledgeable about music, but they've heard enough, they sense enough to realize that here is a historical performance. If you can present that as you do and present your students with the truth and the faith that your playing represents, that in itself is teaching. I go back to what I said earlier, however, uh, about the idea of uh, becoming absolutely masterful technicians without the advantage and without the absolute necessity of knowing the circumstances of the music. I have talked about to colleagues with us over and over and over again, and uh, not everyone agrees that this is important. You already mentioned that uh, you have had students who come to you asking for uh, help with the Paganini concerto, and they know when Paganini lived. Do they know what the instrument was like? Do they know what the strings were like? They're interested, excuse me. Uh, I must say that in 
most circumstances, and I'm referring also to students from Canada and the United States, they have an incredible knowledge. They knew that when Mr. Bach was alive, that strings were very thin. They knew about the so-called Bach bow. They know that the bridge was different. that the bridge was very low. It was almost flat. I think that um, those who are pessimistic, those who would like to convince you, dear Carl, and myself, that the violin is not quite as popular with the audiences as the guitar or the piano. I think they're totally mistaken. I think that there is some sort of a renaissance in violin playing. Oh, yeah. And the young generation is incredibly rich. There are so many extraordinary violinists, and they are not unilateral. They know how to combine virtuosity, musicianship, and respect for style. However, since you mentioned my uh, last performance in New York City, I'm happy to say that uh, the public reacted in a beautiful way. The way which I, I wished for myself. And yet, you are not... Uh, always in command of uh, anybody's reaction. But I felt that while I was playing Brahms and Bach and Beethoven, the atmosphere was extraordinarily concentrated and cordial and enthusiastic. And I shall mention something which some of my friends thought that was um, ridiculous. They thought it was not right. And I had to correct them immediately. It was the post-concert party. And they said, Mr. Sherry, did you realize that after the first moment of the famous C minor sonata for piano and violin, upper 30, number 2, the audience at Carnegie Hall applauded. Isn't that outrageous? I must say, the person who said it was not a professional musician, mm -hmm. but somebody who loves music and great concert for. I said, my dear lady, I was enchanted. And I waited until uh, everything was quiet again. I said, but don't you think that one doesn't have the right to interrupt a mastery performance? I said, I don't know about the mastery performance, but there is a normal, uh, normal break between the first movement, so incredibly agitated, uh, evoking the f uh, already or uh, prophesying the fifth symphony. Yes. And the incredibly sublime uh, second movement. The first movement being in C minor, the second in. A flat major. I think that the break is there. It's normal. The very fact we had applause, I don't take it as an offense. I can take it only as a tribute to Beethoven and maybe to the performance, that is to Mr. Charles Rana and myself. Now, what happened in the second part? And this was interesting. I tried to play works by composers of the 20th century starting with my unforgettable friend from Mexico Manuel Ponce who wrote for Segovia the Concierto del Sur who dedicated to me his violin concerto we played the Sonata Breve and then we played other works also by uh, composers who had some sort of a connection with the uh, school of Paris, the Parisian school. And we finished with the Nocturne Tarantella by Shmanovsky. I must say that 
the audience reacted in an incredible way because normally you would assume as an artist, as a musician, as a musicologist, you would assume that after playing the Tarantella by Vinyavsky, the public should, if it's well played, of course, should shout, clap, and be absolutely enchanted. But that the Tarantella by Shivanovsky, which is, let's put it mildly, in uh, the late 20s or the early 30s, it was considered a truly avant-garde work. Well, the enthusiasm was incredible. And I must say that I've done something which usually I, I try not to do after a very substantial program. Mr. Rana and I, we played, believe it or not, we played for encores. And why not? Why not? I think that there is a time and there is a space and there is a mood for every sort of music, every sort of um, expression. This is why I, I like to be very individual and I like to stick to the old traditions, which are not old because the tradition becomes old because it goes back to a certain period of time. But I don't believe in the, in the age of a tradition. I believe that I am an incredibly lucky man because one of my mentors, Rodislav Huberman, knew Brahms very well. Because one of my wonderful friends who is responsible for my becoming a concert artist, Arthur Rubinstein, was uh, knew Leszczyk, and he knew, of course, uh, he knew Brahms, and he Liszt. and Liszt, and he was a intimate friend of uh, uh, Granados and Albanis and Faye. So you see, I think it's it's a marvelous continuation. I feel that I'm only a link. Uh, I'm just part of of a chain, and this is why sharing not. Uh, knowledge with uh, uh, colleagues, younger colleagues and students is and always will be one of my uh, most cherished desires. However, you stated something a few minutes ago. You said that um, you agreed with Arthur Rubinstein that combining a a concert career, an active concert career, an international, or let's say, as according to the new trends, an intercontinental yes, indeed. concert career, with an activity, even if slightly limited, of an educator, is rather complicated. I agree. Only, this is where I I feel that there might be an answer, and I shouldn't uh, I shouldn't boast about wearing several hats at a time, because it's probably not that difficult. What I teach, or what I coach. I'm learning also, and I'm reminiscing myself certain things which I need for my own performance. So, you see, when some somebody tells me, well, maestro, how can you spare so much time uh, for others when you probably need it for your, uh, your own repertoire? I say, no, this is not true. I think that when I share my time, I think... I think it's, in a way, beneficial for myself. So it's maybe a combination of altruism and maybe egoism. Maybe. However... But how can you help it? It's only a natural sequence of your... It's a natural sequence, and I'm not the only one. There are some colleagues who feel that 
a career should be terribly clear cut. That you shouldn't uh, you shouldn't uh, mix. That uh, you should make cocktails. But I think the cocktails occasionally are very tasty. And I think that if you indulge with moderation, then life becomes uh, more beautiful. But moderation is also one of the great uh, precepts and one of the great um, principles that must be obeyed for reasons of equilibrium, health, and true proportions. And this is when I must evoke the memory of another great man. He was not my teacher. Neither was Huberman, and yet Huberman influenced me tremendously. The great pan-European that he was, reading to my parents in my presence after supper, uh, his magnificent uh, speeches, which eventually he pronounced at the or he was pronouncing at the defunct League of Nations in Geneva in the late 20s, early 30s. I think there's somebody who, without being my teacher, has given me a tremendous inspiration. And I'm afraid that you're already guessing whom I would like to refer to. Pablo Casals, or rather, Paul Casals. Indeed, I had the great honor of meeting him when he was already uh, uh, reaching a very, very mature age. But I think that just listening to him, chatting with him, and trying to understand and to interpret, let's say to translate, some of his concepts. It was a God's blessing. I remember pl having played under his uh, baton, the Brahms concerto, in San Juan de Puerto Rico. And then I remember playing the same concerto at the United Nations, right here in New York City, on the 24th of October, anniversary of the United Nations, 1967. The orchestra was the Vienna Symphony, conducted by a very distinguished conductor, Wolfgang Savalich. And the late and unforgettable and unforgotten Secretary General, Mr. Utan, asked me to say a few words. And I declined the honor at first. I said, in my capacity as a cultural delegate to UNESCO, I would love to say a few words, but I'm here to play the Brahms concerto. I'm not sure that uh, it is the proper um, moment for me to say, well, if you don't feel like uh, speaking for five or six minutes, at least, could you say two sentences? <coughs> and this is <coughs> when I thought that the best would be not to say things which maybe I had said before, or which I could have improvised. I thought that using some special inspiration might be the best in order to make it sweet, short, up to the point. And this is where I thought that Casals, in one sentence, could describe either the, all the evils that are plaguing the world 
I still are, unfortunately. Or in one sentence, he was able to give us hope and to give us faith and um, the conviction that all of us in every territory, in every profession, that we are able to contribute to a better world. And what I said was very simple. And I was actually quoting his words, not literally, but I, I felt the urge to give credit to Maestro Casals for this inspiration. I said that when we are sharing music, all of us, we are like brothers and sisters. And that I was longing for the day when all nations would finally come to terms, not only with their neighbors, but with themselves and their respective governments, and sit together like in an immense concert hall. What a magnificent thought this is. And what a magnificent way in which to prove that sharing, sharing with our listeners and our friends is a privilege not only from a standpoint of witnessing and hearing great performances. I have always maintained, Henrik, that the greatest virtuoso in the world will fall short of his aim if he cannot convey the humanity which is behind the performance, the humanity which makes it possible. And it is this humanity which people sense. It has always been this way in your performances, and surely anybody listening to us today will realize that you've expressed it. You have said it with these remarks that you pronounced before the United Nations. We stand in your debt, and I'm sure that our listeners feel as I do, <clears throat> that it has been a privilege to hear your own views, for this is important. Long after we're gone, long after you and I and all of our colleagues are gone, there must remain not only the records of our performances and, and what we sounded like, but I think there should be for posterity the expression of our philosophy and our views. This is the purpose of our conversation, and for this I'm grateful to you. Rick Sharing Memorial Program 